But welcome, GT family. Man, are you excited to be here? Amen. I am blessed to be here. And how do you know that today might feel just a little bit different? But even on a day where the wind chill is, below, is 35 below, we have guests in the house that's never been here before. And it's my prayer as the pastor here, if I haven't personally met you, I'm Pastor Paul, I'm the lead pastor. I would love to be able to shake your hand and tell you just how blessed we are as a church that your path has crossed ours this morning. Because God has a plan for all of us, right? And as soon as we begin to feel like this is all about us, God gives us a moment like this to interrupt things and say, it's never been about you. This is about me. And he brings us together with intentionality to do something significant in our hearts. So if you're here this morning, if you're listening online, man, there's hundreds of our church family that are listening online, whether you're in Chillicothe or Chillicothe campus people, or you're here, or you're just our normal online uh, campus, I would pray that you listen in because I believe that God has a word for us today. And so if I haven't had a chance to welcome you personally, I'm welcoming you now. But I also want just to communicate a couple things. Um, and our board meeting last week, we kind of delayed it to this week because of um, some issues that were going on and people being sick and those type of things. And so it's like, okay, well, this week it's going to be like 30 below zero. So I'm hoping we meet tomorrow night. But what I want to do is I want to give you a save the date. Whether you're here, you're online, you're part of our church family, and you're a member, I would like to give you a date of save it for March 17th. That will be our annual business meeting, as long as it gets approved by the board when we meet, all right? So save the date, March 17th, we're going to get together. And then right after that, and here's what's really important. God has blessed us, and we're going to open a Chillicothe campus. Come on, all right? And, and so there is going to be a vision meeting for Chillicothe immediately following our business meeting this year. I believe that God has exciting things for Chillicothe. I believe that God brought us together uh, with an incredible opportunity to impact people's lives, and I'm looking forward to it. Now, here's one of the things you can be praying with us about. What we didn't know is that the furnace was going to catch on fire after we said yes. All right, and so there's right off the bat, there's 15 to 20,000 we gotta spend on a furnace, but how many you know that every life in Chillicothe is worth it? Let me say it again, every life in Chillicothe is worth it. And so we're gonna do that. All right, we're studying a book of James, and if you're here for the very first time, um, I would encourage you, the very first week when we jumped into the book of James was entitled Trials and, Tribula uh, Trials and Temptations. I was going to say tribulations, kind of trials and tribulations might be a little bit the same thing. But trials and temptations. And it's really important that we know the difference. There's going to be moments in your life that God challenges you, right? And he wants us to mature in our relationship with him. And it causes us to go through a difficult time. And through that time, as we keep our focus on Jesus, we become more mature in our hearts as believers. When things become a little bit more challenging and we, we go through that, um, that chaos or we go through that, that bad situation, we come out on the other side knowing that God was faithful, therefore giving us the confidence in our heart that he'll be faithful again in our future. But yet at the same time, the Bible also says that don't ever say that God tempts because God is not a tempter. God wants us to live a, a life to its fullest. God wants to bless us. He doesn't want to deter us from the plan that he has for us. And so we need to know the difference, but God will mature us, but at the same time, he is not going to tempt us. And I had a wonderful time last week, and I, I hope you did too, as we talked about God's word being the foundation for everything. One of the comments I made to you last week, and this would be a challenge for you if you weren't with us, is the Bible's very, very uh, plain in its, when it begins to talk about that we should have a foundation in Christ. In fact, it tells us that we should have a strong foundation, right? Well, I made a comment last week that I pray that God would make my foundation so strong that he can build a skyscraper, right? I'm not looking for a walkout ranch, Man, I am looking for God to do a powerful work, and that's my prayer for us as a church, that he will do something so deep and so profound in our hearts that he can take the work that he's doing in us and trust us to communicate it to those who are yet seeking God, yet seeking the answer to all the perilous stuff that's going on around them, to get the answers that can only come from God himself. And so it begins with the word um, being the foundation and our truth in our life, Right? We can look at this and say, well, life is different. Culture is different. But how many you know that the word of God has to be looked at first 
And then we begin to compare it to culture. We don't look at culture and then begin to compare culture to God's word. God's word always comes first. And this week is going to be another challenging word. This week has everything to do with relationship and how we love each other. How many know that the Bible says that God is love? I don't see very many hands going up. Uh, okay, so if you don't have your hand up, I want you to know what the Bible says that God is love. Now, now raise your hand if you know that God is love, right? <laughs> Take my word for it. You can look it up, all right? And so with that, there's something that God wants to do in the heart of a believer that begins to transform us in ways that I don't even think that we're anticipating, all right? I can tell you this, that there's been individuals in my life that in my vulnerability and in my transparency with you, I would have to say, man, I don't, I don't love them, or I didn't love them. All right, don't look at me like you haven't felt that way before, all right? And God works on your heart, and he works on your heart, and he works on your heart, and he matures me. I go through that trial, and you know what happens on the other side? I find myself caring for people that I never thought I'd care for. I find myself loving people that I didn't realize I had the capability to love. Anybody have somebody who's hurt you to the core of your heart? You've had somebody hurt you in your life. We have, haven't we? Every single one of us have had somebody hurt us. And yet it somehow, when we discover the love of Jesus, it gives us the capacity to love them the same way that Jesus loves us. And so we're going to talk about this. The title of today's message is The Power of love and relationship. Like I said, we're in the book of James, and so let me read you a portion of scripture here found in James chapter two, verses eight and nine. He says this, he says, if you keep the royal law found in scripture, the royal law, we'll talk about that in just a moment. Love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. So if you want to keep the law, the royal law was what James is talking about, and you want to do it right, it begins with this, that you would love your neighbor as yourself. And I think we could all, probably all of us quote the Shema, maybe. If, if not, it says in the Old Testament that we should love the Lord our God with all of our heart, our soul, and our mind, right? And some um, uh, uh, translations would say, even in our strength, that we should love the Lord thy God, right? Jesus is questioned by the Pharisees in the New Testament, and they say, hey, why is it they're trying to stump, get him to stumble here a little bit or trying to get him to say something that he shouldn't say? And he goes, well, what do you think is the greatest law? And Jesus says that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, right? And so he gives him this law. But then he goes on a step further. He goes, he goes but the second is just as important that we should love our neighbor as ourself. And so James is here, he's quoting his brother Jesus, right? He says, love your neighbor as yourself and you're doing right, but he gives us this disclaimer, if you show favoritism, everybody say favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Love people, but don't be partial. Love people, but don't show favoritism. Now, I think it's important for us to know that as James is, James is writing this letter, he was the main apostle for the church in Jerusalem, if you're unaware of that. And what was taking place is, was there was a gravitation of people to prefer those who were smarter or knew the law better or knew who were more a part of uh, the Jewish faith, okay? And there was also a bent towards those who were rich, Okay, And so as James is writing this, this, this letter, he's, he's beginning to address some of the issues that's going on inside the first century church. Because how many of you know that it's really easy to like people that are like you? Anybody. But it's really difficult sometimes to like somebody who's nothing like you. All right, anybody have that crazy aunt or that crazy uncle? right? Don't raise your hand. They might be in the room, all right? We all have that individual or that crazy brother, right? Um, uh, the crazy sister. Now, all the, all the, and it's so awesome to have the kids in the house today. Isn't it awesome? That's right. And so, but listen, I mean, we all have that crazy individual that's in our life, and God says, listen, we can love them too, and if you're like, man, I don't know who the crazy person is in our family. Guess who the person really is? 
<laughs> it's you. All right? And the scripture says, James is saying that we should love each other. You should love our neighbor. And as he writes this to the church, he goes, and all of you people who are beginning to show favoritism because they might have a little bit more money in the bank or they might drive a little bit nicer car or they have something that you want and we're, uh, we're acting like we want everything that they have. He goes, listen, make sure that you keep a solid foundation. It's not about that. Let's keep it about Jesus and the love that God can demonstrate. And so this royal law, when James is writing this, I want you to know that you could translate that as, hey, Jesus walked right before us. He showed us the way that we should live our life. He was the law, he was the embodiment of the law. Let's live our lives like Jesus. That is our test. That's our litmus test. That is our qualifier. That if we are living our life like Jesus, then we're doing things the right way. Come on. All right, so let's, let's search this. Let's just talk about this for a moment. If I'm li living my life like Jesus, then I know that Jesus was walking along and he came across this guy and he had been um, paralyzed for 38 years. People wouldn't help him. He was at the pool of Bethesda. And the people wouldn't help him get into the pool. And because they, they had this type of, uh, they thought that if the waters of the pool would be stirred, the first person in would be healed. Okay, so that was the thought. And so Jesus comes across and he, and he asks this person, this underprivileged person, this person who had nothing, this person who was begging at a pool for 38 years, and he said, hey, what can I do for you? If we love like Jesus, should there be something in our hearts that begins to address the underprivileged? Isn't there something that it should be in our heart that begins to say, I will not allow injustice to take place on my watch? Isn't it become upon us that if there's somebody who's not able to eat in our area or our neighbor who can't pay for some groceries, now follow me here, that some type of love should flow out of our hearts to be there and minister to them? That's what Jesus did. He goes, what can I do for you? He goes, well, I get, and, he, and here's what happens. The beggar begins to focus on his problem. And Jesus says, do you want help or not? And he gives him the answer. I believe as people who love the world the way that Jesus loved the world, we have the opportunity to give them the answer when they're not even looking for it. You become Jesus, and they discover who Jesus is. How about another situation about Jesus? You have, see the Bible, when it began to begin to describe people, you had the sinner who was bad, right? The sinner who was, hey, you're a sinner, uh, you are a bad person, but then the scripture would say, and the tax collector, in other words, the tax collector was worse than even a sinner. And there's this guy in scripture, his name's Zacchaeus. And yes, if you grew up in church and maybe you haven't been growing up, you haven't been in church a really long time, they said Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he, right? Now, I don't know how small he was, but we used to do this when I was in kids' church. Um, I guess on TV he would be that big, right? And he climbed up in a tree so he could get sight of what Jesus was saying and what the ministry that Jesus was accomplishing. And all in front of all of the religious people, Jesus went over and said, hey, come on down. I'm going to go to your house for dinner. The person who is the worst of the worst. So now it's not only just the underprivileged. It is a person that we think is the worst on planet Earth. He says, even them. I died for them. I love them. We should minister to them. This is getting crazy, don't you agree? Let me take one more story. He, he comes up to a well, and there's an adulterous woman. And, you know, I'm not giving you scripture reference on this. I'm just trying to give you a small picture that what, what it demonstrates in scripture of what Jesus' heart and what Jesus' love was all about. Because if I don't give you the ability to compare yourself to something, then sometimes we think we're better than we are. He comes up to a well and he finds uh, the, the adulterous woman. In fact, she's been married four, time, four times and she's with her fifth guy and all the people in the city because it was the law that if somebody was adulterous like this that they would be stoned to death. You, go by, you get stones and you throw it at them until they die. Kind of glad we don't do that today, right? And, he, and they come up and you say, what do you think? And so... The scripture tells me that Jesus knelt down, and it doesn't tell us what he wrote, but he wrote something in the sand or in the dirt. 
And then one by one, they all began to leave and walk away. As soon as it was just Jesus and this adulterous woman left standing at the well, he goes, well, who condemns you? And she said, well, nobody, they're gone. He goes, nor do I go and sin no more. There was a love for the person who was so far from the Lord that they were supposed to. I mean, the, the consequence of that was death. And yet Jesus came along to save a life and to love her anyway. And so as James is writing this, I think there's a couple things I want to uh, point out this morning. The first one is this. He, he tells us to do, he gives us two principles. And the first principle is this, is he gives us the commandment to love people. And it would be my opinion that when the church gets this one right, if all we get is this one right, there won't be enough seats in the house to contain what God is doing here. I would say that there's been moments in my life that people have demonstrated love to me when I did not deserve it. How about you? And God has allowed me now to be able to pay that forward and to love somebody who might not, and in my opinion, deserve it because they have hurt me or they've said something about me or they've said something about a family member or they've caused something to create a fight or havoc or whatever it might be. And God is saying that I have the ability to love them. My commandment is that I should love them regardless. This is what it says in Matthew he records the words of Jesus, and I've already mentioned this in chapter 22, verse 39. He goes, the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I think we've already established that Jesus had a way to care for people. And so if I'm going to measure my life, I need to measure my life based on whether or not I care for people the way that Jesus cared for people. What does that also communicate to me? And let's revert back to last week. I should probably be reading a little bit of the New Testament about how Jesus took care of people, and so it can give me some insight on how I can participate in that. And so I want to care for people. I want to be there for them. I want to demonstrate attention to them. How many of you know that we live in a society that some people get all the attention and while others get no attention? What does it look like when the church doesn't set up our prerequisites that way? You don't need to be somebody to be somebody. What does it look like when the church begins to love people the way that Jesus did? The worst of the worst. Hey, Zacchaeus, come on down. Let me go to your house. Let's have dinner tonight. Or hey, adulterous woman, I'm, I'm not going to condemn you either, but go and allow the word of God to transform your life. Sin no more. What does it look like for us to be able to embody that and to give attention to the right things instead of the things that we think somebody, the way that somebody should act? This is so challenging. So, so, so challenging. Let me tell you why, at least for me. There is a, there's just something that happens in a human brain that would expect somebody to be just as mature as a Christian as I am, even though I've served God for 20 years or 25 years. There's something that happens inside of us that as soon as they say yes to Jesus, all of a sudden we begin to expect or think that they're going to immediately, without even knowing scripture, immediately, without even being in a relationship with people who love Jesus, immediately begin to act like Jesus. And we need to get past it and love them, show them who Jesus is. And as they discover more of Jesus, I can promise you the Bible says that his word will not return void. His word will transform them if we allow the word to do it instead of us judging. Amen? So to be Jesus, to love them. And basically, I mean, okay, let's look at a story um, because Jesus is confronted by the uh, uh, Pharisees again and they're talking. He goes, well, who is your neighbor then? And we get this story. In fact, some of us who grew up in church in the Bible, it's called the Good Samaritan. Anybody ever hear that story before? In the Good Samaritan, you have um, somebody who has been robbed and beaten. They've been la- they have been left by the roadside to die. Now put yourself in the first century world where there's no roads like we have roads today. All right, these are dirt trails. And it's in the desert of Israel. All right, it's in the desert. And so they left them in the heat, left them in the sun, and left them in the dirt to die after they have beaten them and taken all their money from them. And from that moment, Scripture tells me that a priest walked by, didn't pay any attention to him, 
and kept going. And then, I'm, I'm paraphrasing this. Everybody said, thank you, all right? And then a Levi walked by. He actually moved on the other side of the road because it was by Levi law that they're not even supposed to get close to anything that was dead. And so he went on the other side of the road to get past them. Then all of a sudden, this Samaritan. Let me describe what the Samaritan was. The Samaritan was considered... Um, I'm trying to think of an appropriate word. In today's world, there's really, there really isn't an appropriate word for me to use. It would have been like the white trash of the Jewish faith. Okay? It would have been, the, oh, don't hang out with them. They're a bad influence. Or don't do anything with them because they're a bunch of sinners. Or, hey, don't, hey stay away from them. And the good Samaritan takes this person, takes them to an inn, takes care of them, nurses their wounds and gives money to the innkeeper and said, hey, what? I'm take care of them and I'm gonna come back. And if it costs more than what I have given you, I'll pay you the difference. And then Jesus asked the question, well, which one was the right, which one was the right choice? And of course, they responded by saying that the right choice was to help the guy. He goes, that's what we are called to do. Amen. So in Luke chapter 10, if you want, in fact, if you go home, I don't know where that story's at. It's in Luke chapter 10. Jesus begins to address compassion and empathy, but he goes a step further and he begins to break prejudice. He begins to break down the walls that are around us that prevent us from ministering to people or having a relationship with people that God, by his design, has always meant for us to have relationship with. To love one each other. Romans, the Apostle Paul, chapter 13 in the book of Romans, he says this in chapter 13, verse 10, love does no wrong to a neighbor. In other words, if God is love and love is in you, in other words, God is in you, then the natural response to that is that we, as people who love God, would not do anything wrong to a neighbor. We've already established what a neighbor is, right? The Good Samaritan in this story, we already established who it is. It's anybody that God has allowed you to cross paths with, to cross influence with, would be considered a neighbor if you want to consider it from a biblical point of view. And he says, listen, you, go on, you, you don't do any wrong to a neighbor, therefore, love is fulfilling of the law. If we can get the love right, the law is just a byproduct of discovering how much God loves us. You might be here this morning thinking, I didn't even know God loved me. You might be here this morning, and you might be even listening online. And you might think that in your brokenness, that God doesn't care. In your brokenness, that God doesn't love you. That you have to clean up before he would love you. And I want you to know that the stories that I've been mentioning to you mention a Jesus that loves you exactly the way that you are, but he loves you so much, he's not going to allow you to stay that way. The commandment is to love people. And I think this really can become challenging at times. Have you ever tried to minister to somebody who didn't want you to minister to them? Come on. You wanted to love them and you wanted to help them and they get mad at you instead of being appreciative for it. Or, get this, most often times you have to develop a relationship before they're willing to give you a voice. Develop the relationship before expecting to have influence. And when you do demonstrate the love of God, and when you do follow this commandment to love people, when you put that into practice, I can promise you, they're going to find you as being different than everybody else because you really do what you say you'll do. You really follow through with the things that you've, God has called us to do. And in that, they find somebody that is so genuine, eventually you will win them over. How do I know that? Because I've done it. People who hated me and despised me. A, a teenager that would sit in the back row and when I was a youth pastor at a church and call me down and make fun of me and do everything he could, even after the service was over, to make me look like an idiot. How many of you know that I wanted to put my hands on him just a few times? God grabbed a hold of his heart. And here's what his statement was. And this is not attention to me. It's attention to the Lord, what the Lord can do in somebody's life. He goes, whatever you have, I want that. I wonder 
Wouldn't that be beautiful if that could become commonplace, that people would come up to you and say, man, I don't know what makes you so different, but I want that in my life. Shouldn't that be the church? This is a visionary type message, church family. Who should we posture ourselves? Should we love the people that we think deserve to be loved or we should be loving people the way that Jesus loved them? The commandment to love. And he doesn't go, let me keep going. I wrote it down this way. Love fulfills the law. That's what he just told us in Romans. Paul writes to church in Romans, says love fulfills the law because in loving our neighbor, we mirror the heart of God. I want more than anything else our church not to be about a person, not to be about a pastor, but about a group of people who love people the way that God loves them. That if there's a reputation, and I want, you, I want to brag on you for a moment, our church has a wonderful reputation that everybody is welcome, everybody is loved, no matter where you're from, no matter what's ever happened, we love them. In fact, I even saw some interaction on social media this week, and somebody posted something about a pastor who dressed up like a hobo. Is, am I okay to say hobo? I guess I can, all right? Hobo, for those of you that didn't grow up in my era, is somebody who is homeless, lives out there. In fact, in my day, they'd live even on a train, a cart train, right? Uh, uh, anyway, and so they dressed up. He sat in the back row, kind of smelled a little bit. I don't know if he, you know, rolled around in the dog stuff in the backyard or whatever the case was, but he smelled a little bit, and they began to not like him or accept him. And somebody from our church wrote and said, that wouldn't happen at my church. That wouldn't happen in my church because there's something that happens when we love people. Amen? Let us be a church that does that. And if you don't feel that love this morning, I pray that you will before our time ends. Okay, so this, this principle, that we should, we should, this commandment to love people. The second principle that he points out, he says to love people, and then he says, hey, no partiality here. We, uh, we, don't, we don't do that. We don't show favoritism. And so there is actually a danger of partiality. When we begin to give one person per preferential treatment over the other people in our life, what it begins to do is demonstrate silos instead of the kind of relationship that God wants where we are all family. I think oh, we can relate to this. I think we have all of us Maybe you're that person who have somebody in your life that didn't seem like they fit in. And when they become to a family event, maybe even the tension would rise a little bit. Anybody? And in that moment, he said, listen, we don't show partiality. We love everybody. And I've heard this, that blood is thicker than water. Anybody ever hear that before? That no matter how bad I would act, I was still accepted because I was part of the family. But that's the way we should love is that no matter how bad somebody acts, they're still part of the family and we love them. There is a danger to bring in partiality. I'm reminded in Acts chapter 10, um, the apostle Peter, uh, he has this vision, he has this dream. And the dream is that in this, he, he began to envision uh, every creature that had four legs. Now, for those of you that might be unaware, Jewish custom would be that you're, not, you're only allowed to eat certain things. You're not allowed to eat pork. I don't know how they made it without bacon, but they did, all right? But you weren't allowed to eat certain things. And, and so in this vision, he sees every four-legged animal. He sees reptiles. He sees birds in this. And God is working on his heart because there's the moment that this God that Israel felt like was confined to just them as a nation was now getting ready when Jesus died on the cross to become the, the forefront of everything that was gonna take place in the entire world. And when, when Peter's having this vision, it began to, he began to keep in mind, he goes, well, I can't eat any of those things. And God made this comment to Peter. He said, don't call unclean what I have made clean. In other words, and then right after this, he, um, there's this, uh, this general in the Roman army, Cornelius. In fact, I, uh, the Bible says that he was a general in the Italian regiment, all right? He had a vision that he was going to meet Peter. He sent his people to go get Peter, and Peter goes, and Cornelius becomes the very first Gentiles to give their heart to Jesus. So the person, as Peter, growing up in the Jewish faith, right, would have grown up thinking... 
I'm not even allowed to talk to that guy because he's a Gentile. For those of you unaware, a Gentile is anybody who's not Jewish. I can't even talk to them. And then this vision, God says, not only are you to talk to them, don't call unclean what I've called clean. It is our responsibility to reach out to everybody, not just to those people who are like us. We shouldn't be partial. John writes it this. Um, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 9, whoever says that he's in the light and hates his brother is still in the darkness. What a challenging word for us, isn't it? That if we think that we're in the light, we've said yes to Jesus, and yet we still have problems with the people around us, we probably should do some self-reflection, don't you think? Well, this is a challenging word. Anybody agree? It's easy to love people who are like us. And maybe you've been the person that people's given favor to. I can maybe be very transparent and vulnerable with you. All the different jobs that I've had, whether it's in the secular world or even in the Christian world, in the church world, God has given me incredible favor for the people that I work with. And I have to be careful that I don't allow that favoritism towards me to prevent me from showing the type of leadership and behavior and love that God wants me to demonstrate to the people around me. Maybe you're the person that's been receiving the favor. In that, pay it forward. Don't keep it to yourself. There's no place for partiality in the church. In Peter's version of this unclean animals, God challenges Peter's biases. We're all biased in some way. He challenges this, and he says, basically, the Lord's telling Peter, my love extends to everyone, not just some people, not just the Jewish race. And it breaks down that barrier, that barrier of prejudice that we were talking about earlier. He takes the message. Cornelius says yes. And it just goes on from there. It actually, it's through the Gentile church that God has sent his message around the world. Isn't it amazing what God can do? Galatians says this. Paul writes to the Church of Galatia, chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew or Greek. There is neither slave nor free, nor is no male and female. For you all, everybody say one. Say it again, one. In Christ Jesus. As we begin to cast vision for 2024 over the church as well as over our personal lives, I wonder what it would look like if we would begin to put these principles into practice. And we would love people the way that Jesus loves them. And we wouldn't focus on a certain group of people, but we would focus on everybody that God allows us to cross their path. It's amazing to me how many times God allows somebody to cross our path that we are completely unaware of. We are completely, I mean, we just miss it. And God did it with such an intentionality for us to influence them, but we miss it because they're not like us. Let me promise you something. In today's world, a lot of people are not gonna be like the church. In today's world, I can promise you that the culture is going to get further and further and further away from Jesus. And if the church doesn't love them, they're never going to know the difference. I want you to know that as, as we become what God wants us to be, it sets the stage, I believe, for the greatest move of God that we have ever witnessed in our entire life. That even though that they are far from God, they can see something authentic from a true follower of God and it begins to work on their heart and it will transform them because that's what Jesus does. I want 2024 to be the greatest year that we've ever experienced as a church. Not just in my life, but in the life of our church. I'm thankful. I'm thankful. Pre-COVID, you know, we're a church of 175 to 200. God was doing some wonderful things. Everybody say amen. amen. And, and as he's watched him, I've watched God's hand be faithful and be faithful and be faithful. We've done just a few funerals. I think I've done 69 funerals. Everybody say, oh my, right? That's crazy, right? And yet today we have over 400 people that are coming to church. God is doing something, which that, you know what does that mean? That means you are leaving this building and you're being Jesus to the people around you. How much greater can it be in 2024 if we let the love of God to be the foundation of how we treat the people around us? Number three, 
It's the application to all of this. Live out his love. Live it out. What would it look like if the love of God became our default system? I hope everybody knows what I mean when I say default system. You know, uh, computers have different operating systems, right? And I think in our lives, we, we compartmentalize sometimes and we have different operating systems that, that go on. We act one way in this circumstance and a different way in another circumstance because that's what the world has taught us to do. I wonder what it would look like if the love of God became our default system that no matter what was going on around us, that our response would be the way that Jesus would respond. I think about the power of relationships, that I can truly see relationships being built in the life of our church. And if you're here this morning or you're listening online and you don't have five to 10 people who will chase after life with you, that will have your back, that will just be on this journey and this battle together, then get in relationship with somebody and have five to 10 people that have your back. Life groups are essential. And for those of you, on, we're gonna relaunch our life groups at the beginning of February. If you've not been a part of a life group in the past, be a part of it and build relationships with people. Paul says it this way to the church of Corinth. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 14. Let all that you do be done in, everybody say it, love. John says it this way in 1 John 3, 18. Little children, let us, I love the way he addresses us. All right, little children, let us not love in word or talk. This is challenging, but in what? In deed and in truth. Don't talk about it. Don't give lip service to something. Hey, let's be the church. Let's love people the way that Jesus loved us. I'm in the church because Jesus loved me. Now let me demonstrate that love to the people that's around me. Faith without love is lifeless. Love should be the heartbeat in our actions. Would you agree? Let me tell you a story and then we're going to close. There's an individual, and maybe you've heard of her. Her name was Corey Tinboom. She has this quote, one of the most famous quotes from Corey Ten Boom was, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. I know it's not gonna be up on the screen because I ran across that quote yesterday. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future. How many know that we don't know what tomorrow has? But we know a God who's on our side. We know a God who is with us. We know a God who will give us strength. We know a God who will become our strength. And in our weakness is most of the time when God does his greatest work. Corey Ten Boom was, and her family were devout Christians and they lived in the Netherlands. And all of a sudden during the Nazi occupation, they were arrested because of their faith. Because what they were doing, they were risking their lives to hide Jews from the Nazis. And they provided a home, a, a safe haven for them to come and not be sent off to a concentration camp. And eventually, the German, pe the German Nazis got wind of it. They discovered and they sent the entire family to the concentration camps. And on one of the moments, uh, Corey Ten Boom, she didn't die in a concentration camp, but she had a sister who did. And as the story would have it, after the war was over, there, the, there was a German Nazi soldier that got saved. They gave his heart to Jesus. And they, their paths crossed again. And so when their paths crossed again, this Nazi soldier reached his hand out to shake Corey Ten Boom's hand. The very soldier that killed her sister. How I many you know this is a, talking about tension in a room? He extends a hand and, and Corey grappling with the pain and her sister's death and the uh, atrocities that she saw at the concentration camp, literally by tens and hundreds, they'd be led off into a room and they would, be, they would be killed. And she watched this over and over and she felt a struggle and yet she remembered the command to love and to forgive. Wow, she, this command to love and forgive. And in that moment, she chose to extend her hand in forgiveness. The act of love and mercy transformed not only her life,
but the life of the guard. Church, what would it look like if in our circumstances, whenever they come and the people, our, our, the divine moments when people cross our path and we have the opportunity to be Jesus, what would it look like if we spoke Jesus over them instead of spoke opinion? That we would speak Jesus over them and love over them instead of condemnation and judgment? What would it look like if we really became the church that Jesus has designed us to become? I'd like to just pause for a moment because love's not just an emotion. It's the healing force that mends broken pieces. Maybe we can worship to this one last song and then I'll come up and we'll close the service. Can we do that together as a church family? Let's speak Jesus over every circumstance. Would you stand with me?